Thank you very much. It's uh, quite difficult to summarize about 10 presentations in, in 10, 15 minutes, um, but I'll give it a try. Um, I would like to also thank Natalie Rolf Peterson uh, for uh, typing and helping uh, the last uh, hours to get the highlights uh, out. But it's uh, our responsibility, and maybe we have missed essential issues, but that uh, can be discussed <laughs> at the break. So we started this morning with the origins of uh, yogurt, and um, in this presentation we learned that about 5,000 years before Christ, that yogurt was first used, and there was thought of a possibility of a medicine at that time. And in the beginning of the 20th century, the modern history of yogurt started, also by the work of Mechnikov uh, and the Pasteur at the Pasteur Institute, uh, and also identifying the responsible microorganisms uh, for yogurt. And today, uh, yogurt is seen as an essential nutrient source. Um, it is uh, high bioavailable, it has a, a nice calcium content, it is r very relevant in cases of lactose intolerance, it contains probiotics, adds, can, uh, fruits, fiber or minerals can be added, and it can uh, be used as a healthy breakfast or as a healthy snack habit. And uh, if you look at the user profile, we learned that there are is a very different patterns in the world. And um, Brazil was given as an example uh, where we could see that nowadays, at least in Brazil, especially young people, female, uh, people uh, with a high socioeconomic status, and in general a healthy lifestyle are using yogurt. And uh, that might be changed, hopefully, in the future. Um, because of the richness of the product. Then uh, we uh, listen to yogurt in relation to appetite control, and um, indeed yogurt could play a role in appetite control through different uh, mechanisms, through different ways. First, uh, maybe the replacement of less healthy foods. It uh, provides uh, essential nutrients, like calcium. Uh, calcium could be indeed uh, implicated in uh, the way it can control appetite. Then uh, the same holds for, for protein, and there were interesting uh, primary, uh, preliminary results that uh, 20 grams of protein yogurt reduces hunger, increased fullness, and delayed subsequent eating compared to a regular yogurt. And then uh, it could also be through impact of the food matrix, where uh, the casein whey ratio is uh, important here to, uh, in relation to appetite control, but also adding fiber and maybe other probiotics could uh, help uh, in weight management. And then it could be a factor of microorganisms uh, having impact on the microbiota. And uh, it was shown by uh, the speaker that energy, that early findings um, which support weight loss by Zemmel were uh, also confirmed, be it in uh, epidemiological studies by Mosaverian met with the Harvard cohorts and also with the Framingham study by Wang, where it could be shown that yogurt is in, uh, in cohort study is related to body weight stability. Then we uh, went to the metabolic diseases in uh, European adolescents and the impact of yogurt facts that, uh, that were present in literature on dairy um, is that in, uh, in adults, uh, in adolescents, null or inverse associations with indicators, indicators of adiposity have been published. And the Helena study uh, there uh, is contributing new facts uh, in 10 European cities, nine countries, in adolescence, 511 adolescents, we learned that yogurt, milk, and yogurt-based beverages are inversely associated with a number of anthropometric measures like BMI, waist circumference, some of skin folds, but also uh, CVD scores, but the latter only in girls. Then uh, the role of milk protein in, in elderly. Um, we picked out a number of uh, 
say, highlights that uh, it is important to consider muscle strength and physical function as the main target and not so much muscle mass. And um, it could be that protein uh, intake stimulates the muscle protein turnover and thereby is uh, implicated in uh, muscle strength. We learned that uh, protein prevents bone mineral density, has CVD benefits, and uh, we also the issue of the quality of proteins, uh, the quantification of the protein quality was addressed uh, through the discussion uh, on uh, DAs, and um, in fact that should uh, result in a true ideal digestibility of uh, indispensable, indispensable amino acids. But what was also said is that, of course, this DA should be validated to functional outcomes. And there were two uh, examples where this has already shown nice results, namely that uh, muscle protein synthesis of whey uh, in this study showed better results than uh, in soy. And the second example which was shown is that less caloric intake with intake it was shown that there was less caloric intake with the intake of high quality proteins compared to low uh, uh, quality proteins. And uh, the discussion goes now that the optimal intake of protein is probably uh, for elderly uh, not so much the 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, but probably more in the direction of 1.5. Then uh, the issue of uh, yogurt proteins in relation to musculoskeletal health was uh, addressed. And we picked out uh, two uh, important issues. Uh, higher intake uh, of protein and vitamin D levels are associated with higher muscle mass and strength and also improve bone health. And um, these effects, positive effects of uh, casein supplementation were shown in hip fracture patients uh, the effect was also seen in a serum IGF-1, and um, it was related as well to a functional parameter, uh, namely low risk of falling uh, in case of a 20 gram of protein on a daily basis. And then the second part of the presentation was on the recommendations from the EU, ESCIO, uh, the European Society and Economic Aspects of Osteoporosis and Osteoarthritis, and it, uh, the recommendations are for elderly uh, about, uh, say, 100 milligrams per day on calcium, 800 international units per day for vitamin D, um, high quality protein, especially from dairy, one gram per kilogram body weight, and a regular physical exercise. And uh, these intakes mentioned here, these recommendations could come either from normal foods, from fortified dairy foods are from supplements. And then the studies on uh, yogurt in relation to incident type 2 diabetes. Um, first, this, the EPIC Interact study was uh, discussed. Uh, this is published in the AGCN in 2012. There were uh, in this huge cohort of over uh, 300,000 subjects uh, 12,403 incident cases, 12 years of follow-up, and it was shown that total dairy, milk, yogurt, plus thick uh, fermented dairy, cheese, no uh, significant association, often uh, close to null findings, but uh, for the combined fermented dairy, uh, the hazard ratio was 0.88, and it was statistically significant. And in the Norfolk uh, EPIC study, which has much better, or I should say uh, better, but yeah, better uh, data on diet um, and uh, covered uh, 892 cases, 11 years follow-up, published in Diabetologia in 2014. It was shown that yogurt uh, in the highest versus the lowest turtile of intake was associated with a hazard ratio of 0.72 and was statistically significant. Moreover, low-fat fermented dairy uh, products uh, had a hazard ratio of 0.76, was also significant. And this is in line with previous studies, as mentioned here, with Tong, with Geo, and with Own, all published. And if you would translate these uh, observational epidemiological findings to public health, 
it would mean that you would have to eat 125 grams of yogurt per week, uh, in, and that would be associated with a 28% uh, risk reduction of type 2 uh, diabetes. It was also mentioned that, in fact, in terms of uh, providing evidence uh, for uh, beneficial effects of yogurt, we, uh, we, it's very difficult to rely on intervention studies uh, because they are costly with hard endpoints and maybe even not possible. So we need uh, to have this kind of studies and, and also learn about mechanisms to uh, be convinced that it's, uh, it's very good to eat yogurt. And then, uh, the two final presentations, uh, we put the two presentations on the microbiota we put together and put it in a, say, perspective in relation to gut microbiota. It's, in fact, new evidence coming up. And um, again, here we s th there is clearly a, a potential influence of obesity and diet on gut microbiota, uh, altering the host metabolic potential. Um, we learned from the experiments, we saw that gut microbiota might increase the harvest of energy from the diet. It might uh, have influence on gut permeability and fat deposition in the adipose tissue and the liver. Um, but the question is, of course, uh, what does it mean for fermented, what does this mean for fermented dairy products? Uh, is this, and also, is, is there a possibility that these dairy products could also modulate gut microbiota? I think new uh, uh, research is, is of, yeah research is, is necessary on this issue, and then the second um, a certain lactobacilli and, and our bifidobacteria, and we have heard a number a ramno, uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus, for example, may attenuate stress response of the EPA axis. It could reduce uh, anxiety-like behavior. I have to say it's often studied in, in, in of course, uh, in, uh, in animal studies, um, uh, but some human studies are very promising in this respect. And also these uh, lactobacillus bifidobacteria might prevent behavioral changes associated with autism. But again here, uh, how would this relate to fermented dairy products? What would be the influence on behavior and mood? And then finally, the, the, the presentation on sustainability. We picked out uh, five uh, highlights. Um, food security is really uh, uh, already now a challenge, but in the future it will be an, a massive challenge related to energy, to food, to water availability versus climate change. Um, what we heard is that the livestock is providing 17% of the daily energy 35% uh, of the daily protein in the human diet. And we also uh, understood that nutrient richness of milk helps minimizing carbon footprint of a diet. And as an example, one gram of milk versus 2.5 grams of wheat uh, would be needed to fulfill the indispensable amino acid and uh, uh, nitrogen requirements. That's quite a difference. And then uh, energy and protein efficiency of the dairy cow is in the Netherlands around 25% and uh, the return and the return on the uh, human edible part more than 400% I should say in the Netherlands not uh, the first part but the second part and uh, it's also important to realize especially in countries like India Vietnam etc uh, that the increase in the milk production improves sustainability there is clearly a lower uh, greenhouse gas emission. Um, this is what we picked out, but you have made picked out several other issues because I think it was a very attractive program where we have listened to. Thank you very much.